So I've never done this before. So uh, this is your Bible study for Tuesday night, January the 30th. And what we're going to do is, is just walk down through each daily devotional and um, the scripture that was highlighted and the question um, for each and every single one of the daily devotionals. I uh, can't go too deep on this as we go in class. Uh, I'm not sure anybody wants to sit and watch for an hour anyways. But what we'll do is we'll read down through the daily devotionals and then raise the question and then I'll just give you a basic um, point as to what I uh, was uh, shooting for in each daily devotional. We're going to begin with uh, January 23rd and the reading that day was Matthew 20. Three. Here's the devotional for that day. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves upon the seat of Moses. Therefore, all the things they might tell you, whatever they are, do and observe, but do not act in accord with their deeds, for they speak and do not do. And here was the devotional for January the 23rd. We must live in this world until we physically expire, and then we can begin to taste the afterlife without any temporal hindrance or confinement. Certainly, parts of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, can be enjoyed while in this world, but the fullness of it will be post-mortem. Jesus is giving the crowds guidelines for sure. But the Messiah is also placing before us a definite crossroads. The Christ says that the religious authority of the world system holds much power in the world. Thus, necessary subjection to its laws must be upheld if there is to be freedom of public spiritual practice. Jesus keeps the law and the law. And in the areas where he seems to defy it and is challenged, the master always offers scripturally sound rebuttal to his accusers that cannot be refuted. So, with necessary subjection in place, Jesus asks us how we are going to choose to live. Certainly, an individual can pursue the ways of religious establishment with all its icons and practices and fashion and food requirements. But, Jesus says when an individual chooses the road of temporal religion, then the person will become twice as much a son of Hinnom's veil as the religious system's rabbi to whom he has subjected himself. Jesus is teaching us, saying, Why pursue a religious system that is dying? The deeds Jesus calls us to act in accordance with are those he is displaying. Truly, the fullness of the Father is alive in the Son, so choose the road to life who is the Son. Then the fullness of the Godhead will momentously and progressively live through you. While living in this world system, God must be our pursuit. Hmm. The meditation for that day was be subject to the system's laws, yet live for God. And the question that I asked um, for that daily devotion was, how does a person remain subject to the world systems of laws and still live for God? Well, certainly there are things that we have to do in this world. We have to pay our taxes and stop at stop signs and so on and so forth. And Jesus is saying to us, you have to obey those things. And as we obey those things, we can operate as we need to do. One of the things that I often say to, to kids is, is you, you cannot... Um, live your life in such a way that the system controls you. You should be subject to the system so much that you have freedom within it. And so there are some things that we have to do. And, and um, you know, these, these laws and, and, and whatnot are not going to uh, 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 be present in heaven, most of them. But um, while we're operating in this world, we, we have to obey the laws that are out there in front of us. But we can't compromise. I mean, we can't compromise God, obviously, but we have to obey the laws of, of this world. And as we obey the laws of this world, then we have freedom to operate um, in a spiritual manner. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, here we've got these Pharisees and uh, they've seated themselves in Moses' seat. And so you have to be subject to them. But listen, there's a greater way of living rather than just simply um, checking boxes and 
and um, you know, proudly uh, saying, I am a religious person. Jesus says the root of who we are is, um, is one of love. And so we should operate in a pattern of love. And when we do so, um, there's a great deal that changes in each and every single life. So basic look there, all right? So obey what laws you have to obey within the system. And uh, as you uh, obey those laws, you, you, you um, are working within system rather than having system dictate to you uh, everything. And as you, you play by those rules, then, then you can operate with a, a level of relig religious freedom uh, within it. Probably the greatest uh, example that we can give is, is uh, working within the public school system. We don't buck their rules. We are very kind to them. We are very um, compliant to them. And as we've done that, um, we've become a friend of the public schools. And now we, we see us working with the lunchbox program. We see us working here at Kingdom with the before and after school program. We see a summer program that's coming in, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes originally, now Athletes Edge. Uh, Pastor James speaks in the school system. If you're kind and you're not uh, you know, always on a soapbox, uh, the world has a tendency to be a little bit more favorable to you. And when they're favorable to you, um, they're a little bit more favorable to your message. And um, uh, it's, just, it's just an easier way to, to move in. So that's the basic uh, thing that we're looking at with uh, January uh, 23rd. January 24th, the reading was Matthew 24. And here was the scripture that we highlighted in the daily devotional. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But whoever endures to the end, this one will be saved. Who then is the faithful and prudent slave whom the master appointed over his household slaves to give them food at the proper time? Here's what I wrote on January 24th in regards to Matthew 24. The disciples asked Jesus when the end of the world is going to be. Jesus answers them not with the day or the time, but with a call for readiness. Jesus says, as lawlessness increases and the end of the age occurs, we prove ourselves ready by never allowing our love to grow cold. The prudent make love their life's labor. What if we just love? When there is hate, we love. When there is opportunity for retribution, we provide restoration. When there's violence, we respond with nonviolence. Where a wrong is done to us, we graciously give forgiveness. Even though we somehow believe ourselves to be keepers of God's holiness, God's holiness will not be tainted if we choose to live as God lives. Jesus says, if we see the Son, then we see the Father. The Apostle Paul reminds us, Jesus is the image of the invisible God and that it is the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of God to dwell in Jesus. Somehow we believe the Father to be the bad cop and Jesus to be the good cop. This is ridiculous. God is God. God is seen fully alive in Jesus because Jesus is God. And God's attributes are to be interpreted by us as we examine the character revealing actions of Jesus. As we know God's life, we live as God lives. This is not imitation. Rather, it is the natural flow of God living through the surrendered life of the individual. In this, we are prepared for the Lord's return. Be prepared. Love. And the question that I asked you to consider on that day is why is loving to be considered the greatest sign of preparedness. Now, I've used this example many times before, but here I am on video right now. And, uh, you know, obviously before Leslie and I left for Israel, we spent a lot of time talking to our kids about what the rules were. And we said, all right, before we leave, I want you to know this. We shared with them the most important things. And that's what Jesus is doing here in the, in the 24th chapter of Matthew. And, and the same thing in, in chapter 25 as we'll, we'll move to next. The reality is Jesus says that there is a level of preparedness that has to be in place in our lives as we look for the, the, the return of Jesus of Nazareth. And um, I'll get into it here more in a second when we look at Matthew 25. But this is what Jesus is saying. The greatest indicator 
as to whether or not we are prepared for Jesus' return is how we love. And that's how he concludes this discussion of his return, just like Leslie and I did with the kids before we left for Israel. We said, this is what you need to know as we're leaving. And that's what Jesus says here. When we're looking at my upcoming departure here through death, burial, resurrection, ultimate ascension, this is what you need to know. If you're going to be prepared for my return, you need to love. And, and, and that's why that question um, is so very important. Why is loving to be considered the greatest sign of preparedness? Because it's how Jesus lived and it's how he calls each of us to live too. Let's just go right into Matthew 25, all right? And that's what Jesus says. And, and, and here's the scripture, Matthew 25, verse 46. And these will go to the chastening of that age, but the just to the life of that age. And, and, and here, here's what I wrote. Has your experience with Christianity been more about hell and who is going there and about heaven is who is going there? When Christianity is based upon the where's and the who's rather than loving or not loving, then we stepped into the place of righteous judge, who we are not. God alone is righteous judge. Jesus says the two things will be remanded to each according to the amount of the individual's offering judgment and forgiveness. Jesus says, as one judges, the one will be judged. As one forgives, the one will be forgiven. It would seem that we all would be better served to spend our days moving deeper and deeper into the love of God through submission and then offering that love to others than it would be to sit on a perch and spend our time examining society to determine who is in and who is out. Let us not think too highly of ourselves. Jesus says all 10 virgins fell asleep while they were waiting on the bridegroom to return, and that those on the king's right were unaware that they were caring for Christ and the caring for the least of these, their brothers and sisters, because they were just doing what came naturally. They loved without expectation of reciprocation. At some point, Christians need to realize that Christianity is about becoming a lover, not a gatekeeper. One is to be our lifeblood. One will never be our responsibility. And then I wrote, move from the perch and deeper into God's love. The question for the 25th of January was this, how much of your life in Christ has been spent in judgment of yourself and others? And then the second question along with that, what is the importance of loving as God loves and allowing God to be the righteous judge that God is? So much of our life in Christianity has been about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Really, that is an important thing because you want to know where you're going, obviously, and you can have assurance of salvation. And so we should focus on that, but not in terms of judge. God alone is judge. God takes care of the judgment we are supposed to be reconciled with God through submission of our own individual lives through Jesus of Nazareth um, and his death, burial, and resurrection. He's Messiah. He's made that way for us. But then once we have accepted that personally, we don't need to stand there and be the gatekeeper for God. What we need to do is offer the good news of the gospel in very tangible ways and through, through the um, teaching of the way uh, of accepting Christ and then living as God lives. And, and, and that is our responsibility. And as you look at these two questions, we've got to move away from judgment and move into the life of God living through us every single day of our lives. And how we do that is love. And that's why Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 go together. As Jesus concludes this discussion about the end times, he says, I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty you gave me drink. I was naked. You gave me clothing. I was without shelter and you brought me into your home or provided shelter for me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then those who have been living as God has lived would say, wait a second, when did we see you in any of these ways? And Jesus says, when you've done it for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you, you've done it for me. And so it should be the natural extension of our lives as Christians. And that's what Jesus says 
If you want to know that you're ready for my return, then you're loving. And you're not just following some list of morality. You're loving in order to glorify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're loving like that, if you're saying Jesus is Lord, if you're saying Holy Spirit is all around us at all the time, and I'm living to do the Father's will, then that means you're prepared for Christ's return. You're loving a life. You're living a life. You're living a life of love. That's what it comes down to. We move on to January 26th and Matthew 26. The scripture is, And standing up, the chief priest said to Jesus, Do you have no answer to what these men attest against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the chief priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us if you are the anointed, the Son of God. And Jesus says to him, You have said it. But I tell you, you will presently see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming upon the clouds of the sky. Here's what I wrote. In order to understand Jesus' silence, one must understand Jesus' words recorded in John 10, 17 and 18, where the Savior says, For this reason the Father loves me, that I lay down my soul so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me. Rather, I lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. There is not a chief priest, nor a false witness, nor Satan, not even death itself, that dictates the conditions and time of the Savior's death and resurrection. Jesus was, is, and never will be subject to this world, spiritual or physical, because Jesus is life. Because Jesus was sinless while incarnate, he was permitted to make himself subject to death on his own terms, such as the Father's will. He permitted himself to drink death like water as a sinless sacrifice. And because he is the sinless sacrifice, Jesus walks in the place of death with death having no hold over him. Jesus is the bridge between death and life. This is what is meant by there being no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. God is not bought. Rather, God bridges. The blood of bulls and goats were but a foreshadowing of the bridge that has come and still is. Holy communion is a statement of Christ's connection between us and God, and as a result us with God. Jesus looks at death and says without saying, I owe you no answer, for you hold no power over me. This is the life in whom each is called to live. And then the meditation for that day was live in the authority of silence. The question that I asked you was this, what does Jesus' authority to lay down his life and take it up again have to do with his silence before the chief priests. And really it comes down to that final sentence or final two sentences. Jesus looks at death and says without saying, I owe you no answer for you hold no power over me. This is the life in whom each is called to live. Think about Jesus' silence when uh, he's before the Sanhedrin and Annas and Caiaphas. They keep asking him question after question after question after question. He, he didn't come to this earth to provide for himself a defense to um, stop his crucifixion. He came to die on a cross. When he's before Herod, Herod says, I've heard about all the tricks that you can do. Do a trick for me. Jesus is not a magician. He did not owe King Herod an answer. The reason he came was to die on the cross. Pilate looks at Jesus and says to Jesus, you sit there and you say nothing. Do you not understand that I have the power to crucify you or let you go? And Jesus says, you don't have any power over me. The only power you have has been granted to you by my Father in heaven. If he wouldn't have granted you that power, you would have no power. 
And as Jesus says all of those things, what he's saying to them is, I owe you all nothing. I owe you nothing, but I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to lay my life down on my own terms. This is a, 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 a command I received from my father. And so you can't stop it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. I lay my life down and I raise it up again. Jesus is the only person who ever lived without fulfilling the requirements for death. At the beginning of the, the collection of books, that is our Bible, God says to Adam, if you sin, then you die. Well, Jesus never sinned, and yet he made himself subject to death. And because he made himself subject to death without sinning, death couldn't hold him, couldn't hold him. So this is the reason why Jesus doesn't have to give an answer. And the, and the thing is, the world cries for us to answer all the time. The world cries for us to be caught up in its noise and its speed. We don't have to be caught up in the world's noise. And we don't have to be caught up in the world's speed. All we have to do is live within the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our very silent Lord. I would you know, this last year, really, God has been speaking that to me strongly. He, he has said to me many times, son, it doesn't say go as fast as you can and make as much noise as you can and you will know that I am God. He says, no, slow down, get to the silence and you will experience my stillness. Be still and know that I am God. We have the right to live in the silence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. January 27th, the reading was Matthew 27. The scripture was, and Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor interrogated him, saying, You are the king of the Judeans. And Jesus said, You say it. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders of the people, he made no answer. Then Pilate says to him, Do you not hear all the things they attest against you? And he didn't answer, not a single word, so that the governor was greatly astonished. Here's what I wrote. In the face of death, most crumble. Jesus is martyr, but the Savior is far beyond martyrdom. The unblemished lamb is the perfection of martyrdom. And as such, Jesus calls every one of us to welcome his death, burial, and resurrection into each one's existence. As we do, we are bathed in the gospel. We bathe in the agony of the cross. We bathe in the waiting and the patience of Saturday's tomb. We bathe in the divine darkness of the joyful, glorious resurrection. We owe the world no answer but the good news of the gospel. It's our silence that calls even the violent agents of this world's injustice to great astonishment. This is what it truly means to love the sinner and hate the sin. When we live a life in the resurrected silence of the gospel's fullness, sinners cease being sinners and they are transformed into those God loves. God is the righteous judge. We are those who offer the good news of God's love. Jesus looked deeply into Judas's kissing eyes. Jesus looked deeply into Peter's denying eyes. Jesus looked deeply into Annas and Caiaphas' unjustly retributive eyes. Jesus looked deeply into Pilate's pagan eyes. With one look, Jesus uncovered their masquerade of control and declared their need for the Savior. Judas threw back the money and confessed that he had betrayed an innocent man. Peter wept bitterly after realizing he had three times denied as the Messiah had predicted. Pilate put up a sign saying, I wrote what I wrote. This man is the king of the Jews. Annas and Caiaphas saw that he did not come down until his dead body was taken down by the hands not his own. Confident silence is a convicting thing. Like our master before us, we owe the world nothing but the good news of the gospel. Once again, we tell you, live in the authority of silence. The question that I asked to think, you to think of on the 27th was this, when we live in the resurrected silence of the gospel's fullness, sinners cease being sinners and they are transformed into those 
God's lo God loves. And I asked you to explain this statement. Am I saying here that there is not sin? My goodness, no. There is absolutely sin. I sin. You sin. There's sin throughout the world. We were born with um, the mark of Adam upon, of our, uh, upon our lives. Certainly, we, we sin. Um, and, and there is sin present within us. But there's the grace of God that is upon us too. And so when this statement is made, when we live life in the resurrected silence of the gospel's fullness, sinners cease being sinners and they are transformed into those God loves. This is about us. This is about us living life in the silence of, of, of the gospel's fullness, death, burial, and resurrection. And when we live life in that silence, we are no longer people who judge. We recognize, and I've said this 15 times in this study, we recognize that God alone is righteous judge. We certainly see sin, but what we do is we don't simply see the person, oh, that sinner, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing we can do for them. They're, they're too far gone. No, 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 no. We see these individuals as people that God loves. And the good news draws them from the life of sin, the life of death, all of those things, the life of falsehood, into the beautiful love of God, into the truth of God. And, and that's what we have to do. We've got to stop saying, well, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. Because when we say things like that, I mean, that might be true, but let's be honest. We probably are saying, well, I, I hate the sin, and I'm not sure they can get themselves out of it. You know, so why even try? We've got to move beyond that. We recognize sin, but we recognize the power that is present in the reconciling Christ. And so we allow God to be judge. We be the bearers of the, um, the good news of the gospel, and we bring that gospel to whomever God puts before us. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll come to that saving relationship with Christ also. So that was January 27th. Let's move on now to January the, the 28th. I, I, think we have, um, I think we have two more, uh, 28th and 29th. Let's go through both of those here. Try to finish up here within oh, 30 or 35 minutes. Here we go, uh, Matthew 28. But the 11 disciples went into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus appointed them. And seeing them, he prostrated, uh, uh, seeing them, they prostrated themselves, but some doubted. This, this is an amazing scripture. In this scripture, we see both sides of the Christian life. We question how it is that any of the disciples could doubt, yet we doubt too. We go to the Galilees to which Jesus calls us. We recall all the old country churches, beachfronts, and starlit skies where the Savior appointed us. We will never forget those places where we fell on our faces before him, broken and then restored by his hand. Yet we doubt too, saying, I know you're able, but are you willing? We doubt too, saying, I believe, help my unbelief. We doubt too, saying, unless I see and touch and place. We doubt saying, make the fleece wet. We doubt saying, keep the fleece dry. We doubt saying, after all this time, what's in it for me, God? We are there, and yet not quite there. So we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The good shepherd's sheep know his voice. The sheep will one day hear what they will never hear until then. Well done, enter into your rest. God's sons and daughters go. God's sons and daughters see. God's sons and daughters prostrate themselves. God's sons and daughters doubt. God alone is God. We are those God created and loves. Live honestly. Sons and daughters are both believers and doubters. And here was the question that I asked you to look at for today. Why will doubt always be a part of the life of every son and daughter of God. Uh, very simply stated, we, we live in a world of sin. It's, it's what Paul said. Boy, there are just some things that I would love to do, 
but I don't do the, I don't do those things. And there are other things that I don't want to do. And it just seems like every once in a while I find myself doing those things. I love how Paul cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of flesh? And he says, I thank my Lord in Christ Jesus. There's always this struggle that we're going to have in this world. We, we can live passionately for God and we can love God, but we're always going to make mistakes. And that's the beautiful circular movement of this life. We love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, but every day we go deeper and deeper still. I've always looked on this quote by A.W. Tozer and drawn strength from it. Tozer says it's when we find God that the real search begins. And that's why, even standing before him, there's still some level of doubt. We see it throughout the scripture. We see it in our own lives. Hopefully that doubt is minimizing the older that we get. But the reality is we do struggle. We do struggle. So that's uh, January 28th. And we finish the the Gospel of of Matthew. Great job. We start on January 29th with uh, Mark 1, and this is the last one for this study. And Mark 1, I love this. This is a great passage. It's one that I've I've drawn great strength with. And and let me be honest, as I begin this discussion about rising early, there are many mornings where I rise early, but there's a lot of mornings that I don't rise early either. Don't become legalistic about this scripture, okay? God wants to, wants to meet us early in the morning, but he wants to meet us throughout our day. He wants to meet us throughout the evening. He wants to even meet us while we sleep. The point is, is that we, we, we begin the day with God. We live with God throughout the day and we end the day with God too. But rising early is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's where we get uh, the first devotional from Mark 1. And rising very early in the morning, in the darkness, Jesus went out and departed to a deserted place and prayed there. And here was the devotional for um, uh, yesterday uh, on Mark 1, to steal away. Ministry is important, but in stealing away, faith, hope, and love come to flower. There's something about very early in the morning. There's something about in the darkness. There is something about departing to a deserted place There's something about praying there. Paul calls us to imitate Christ, yet Jesus is not a pattern and number of dance steps to be followed. Jesus is to be permitted to live through each surrendered life. Imitation ultimately assumes control. We are clay in the control of perfectly dirty hands. We rise to meet Christ early because early is when the Savior, who does not sleep, rises. The world sleeps at dawn. Some because they're gluttonous with slumber. Some because their days have just ended. There was first evening. Then there was morning. Then there was the first day. We rest. We rise. We meet God. We share God's goodness without ever leaving God's side. Such is the pattern of the eternal wind who shapes the character of his children. Rise very early in the darkness, depart to the desert, and pray. The question that I asked you to think about that day is, how is Jesus' practice of stealing away early to pray an example for us to be kept throughout the entire day? and not just the morning. Again, that's why I said the thing about dance steps. And it's funny as I'm, as I'm reading this here, I see, I see a, a, a typo here. I said there's smoothing about. It needs to say there's, there's something about. I apologize that from, uh, from, the, uh, from the devotional. But anyways, pr- prayer, it needs to flow. And think about that. The Jewish the Jewish uh, mindset sees the day not beginning at dawn, but beginning at, at, at sunset. As the sun goes down, the next day begins. It begins with rest. And so um, right there, we, we, we say to God, look, we know that perfection is, is, is um, the bow is kind of um, coming with rest. So God, as we begin to focus on this new day, we want to start at the place of perfection. 
And God, I'm asking you in this time of rest to, to begin my day properly. And then after proper rest is given, really while the rest of the world is asleep, okay? Rise, rise and, and welcome God even before the, the sun shines its face out upon us. Arise and welcome the day with God by your side. Just saying, thank you, God, for this beautiful new day. And then as the sun rises, we still call upon the name of the Lord. We call on his name in every situation, in every way. That's how we're called to live. And then as we go through the day, we, we see the rhythms of God all around. We see the presence of God. We hear creation crying out and singing to God in beautiful songs. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And then the day finishes. And then you look back over the whole day and you say, you know, I began with rest. I began with silence. I lived with rhythm. And this has been evening and morning, a good day. That's how life is to be lived. And I pray that each of us are living it in that way. Uh, that's the Bible study uh, for this Tuesday. Uh, Leslie and I, I, I guess, are sleeping somewhere in uh, a hotel in, in Tel Aviv with our, our fellow pilgrims um, in their rooms, and we're getting ready to head to Galilee tomorrow. It's been, uh, I'm guessing, an exciting journey so far. I'm, I'm, I'm filming this on Saturday night, and um, it's just uh, it's something that I've always looked forward to. And uh, here we are. Um, we're tracking the, the footsteps of the Lord that we talk about every single day. So pray for us as, as we're away. We'll, we'll be back to you here uh, in a week and um, uh, come back uh, a week from tomorrow. So uh, I just pray that uh, your prayers are with us as we, we travel this pilgrim, pilgrim's journey. Um, so please pray for us. So I'm going to pray for you all now and just pray your, a blessing upon you. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful study that you've given us here tonight in this 35 or 40 minutes that these folks have looked on. And I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your blessing upon them. I pray, Lord God, that they know you in a perfect way, even though we'll always be imperfect until we come to that great glorification in front of you, Lord God. Um, I just pray that we know your perfection. Jesus, you said, be perfect now as your Father in heaven is perfect. You've called us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You said there are some among us who will not taste death until they've seen the glory of the kingdom. God, I know it's right before us and I pray for all of us here that we begin to bathe in the fullness of your glory, Lord God. May your blessing be upon us. I pray for Leslie and I and all our fellow pilgrims here in Israel, uh, even as I shoot this in my office, uh, uh, I just pray that uh, your blessing would be upon us and that the trip that we are taking is one that's not vacation, but truly pilgrimage. Keep us safe. Keep us in your care. We love you and give you praise, God. I love these people very much. May your blessing be upon them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless. Uh, next week's Bible study will be posted on Tuesday. Uh, watch it and enjoy. We will see you soon. God bless you.